We have a guest, wow. <laughs> Mr. Idris Mohammed, has joined us. So it might be rude to uh, leave him out. So I'm going to invite him in, and um, so he can be part of our of what we're doing. So we can. Um, so want to welcome everybody. Um, we're going to welcome everyone, Mr. Idris wow. Mohammed. What's up, um, dude? <laughs> wow. Yes, well, welcome, welcome. Really glad that you can join us. Yeah, what's going on? I um. I heard uh, I heard my my boys the Black were on about a couple of months ago, and then Mucho was on about a couple of years ago. So I'm glad <laughs> to be here, man. Yes, yes, you know, um, yeah, definitely Mucho, um, Sprague, um, um, Speck, yeah, yeah KB, um, yeah. Sean, yeah. So they they're all they're they're they're, they're part of our, our family. So yeah, they've been down with us since. Since day one, yeah. And so, um, you know, we 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 do have a we're we're going for our top ten favorite R and B tracks. Okay. And, and I didn't want to spoil it, but because you're here, um, none but a party is my all time favorite New Jack Swing track. Okay, because you know so, I was I was on nothing, I was on nothing <laughs> but a party. <laughs> well, I know, that, yeah. So I mean, to, yeah. So, oh, I mean, I okay. Was, yeah, so I didn't want to spoil it, but because he's here, I couldn't just let that slide to let him, you guys know. But I'm still gonna have to. I still have my other nine to go to go through. But yeah, definitely welcome. Um, we're, cool. we're definitely honored that you can join us. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. But look, yeah. I think I jumped in in the middle of in the middle of my brother talking, so I'm just gonna sit here <laughs> and just relax until you get to me. Okay, so go ahead, keep it popping. Yeah. So, because what we're doing is um, we 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 were reflecting on DOA Allen. Um, okay. Oh, Derek yeah, DOA absolutely. Allen. So we had an interview with him, and we just wanted to reflect on on our thoughts about how, you know what we learned and what we picked up from it. Okay. Shut cool. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying as far as him just uh, being on the road with them. And the experiences that he had that was very eye-opening for me and in a climate where you know compensation is really a big thing um that that environment that he was in he didn't get paid um a lot but evidently he came away from that with so many different great experiences and then just him having that insight on being that 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 fly on the wall seeing they do their thing in their prime like that that was really good yeah, but, and, and you know, it, and you know, when you look at the reflection between New Edition today and and how to wear Troop on now, I think there's a lot of people who forget how um, how awesome Troop were, and and I keep telling people because during the time Troop were out, I was still in Nigeria, and for us, Troop were a band who who were, were dancers who could sing. I mean, that's how we saw them. We were just floored by that. So for him. Being a musician on tour with them to just see them working hard, that 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 was really important to reflect on. I mean, Idris, I mean, did you? What are your thoughts of Troop and 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 what they back in the day? I think Troop were, were very underrated. Unfortunately, um, I think they were phenomenal um, singers um, and phenomenal dancers. Um, uh, Troop choreographed all of their material and uh, their dance material, so I think that they were phenomenal. And I think that they. Uh, the remake they did of All I Do if, Is Think of You by the Jacksons was, you know, second to none. I mean, no one could have done it better. Um, and uh, I, I de definitely think that they were over underrated as a group in a, in a whole. Um, they had excellent harmonies. Um, I forget what the younger guy's name was. I think it was John John. Was it? Yeah, the, John the one John. That, right. The younger guy that had the, uh, the, the he, he had the deep voice, sort of like a... Um, 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 a Johnny Gill kind of sound. Uh, he was amazing, but in uh, in all, I think Troop was a great group. Yeah. Stevie, I mean, I don't want to spoil the whole interview for any <laughs> yeah. But I, I just felt I was watching your reactions. The the whole interview was like a movie. It started off, you just getting into it slow, slow. And then after about 20 minutes, it just it just takes off. It's like a crescendo of drama and stories. And it just the way he just drops his stories, I was just blown away. Absolutely blown away by the whole interview. Obviously, 
the the demos the song he'd wrote for Bobby Brown, the couple of tracks that he'd wrote, and it turns out that one of them, one of the tracks, never came out featuring Whitney Houston. Yeah. And when he actually played the track for Bobby in his in his car, <laughs> okay. 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 It just blew me away. You know, and just watching your reaction as well. You know, you're you're finding all this out for the first time. We're finding it all out. Thirty years on, which is incredible. <laughs> So, yeah, because yeah. I, I remember seeing his name on CD credits, and I always thought, "Who is this guy, DOA?" And and once I started seeing his cre- his name on the credits, I, I bought <coughs> it up as well, because that's how I ended up building the collection up, just through wow. seeing credits and names on New Jack Swing albums. And I thought, I never saw a picture of this guy. I just thought, this this guy is is really solid, you know. He's yeah. yeah, great interview, fantastic interview. <laughs> You know that ha- that happened a lot back in the days. Like um, a lot of a lot of the bigger producers would, because they were making so many hits at the time, they would get uh, producers to be on production teams. And what would happen was, um, no matter who created the uh, sound or the the record, um, that big producer would get the credit. So, like I was down with the Teddy Riley camp. So. Um, th- I, I, I got into the game from um, David Wynn. Um, okay. I, I, I started off with David Wynn. I was like 17 years old. And, um, wow. and so David Wynn, before he met Teddy, he did a song on Rob Bass's album. Um, what's the one with um, Get on the Dance Floor? He did that song. And then, then he went and started working with Teddy. And what people don't know is that David Wynn produced Rump Shaker. Um, People don't know that um, because Teddy got the credit um, uh, and, and he got the credit because obviously he was Teddy Riley. And then, uh, you know, uh, and then Mucho produced uh, Roughneck and Mucho produced the Human Nature remix. Uh, he also produced My Love for Mary J. Blige. Um, so all of these things, there were production camps. And what would happen would be that, you know, the the, the harder produced, the, the, the hottest producer that, had these camps would just take the credit and sometimes, you know, they would get, you know, some money. I mean, they would get money, but it wouldn't be substantial enough as the, as the producer, like, you know, like, so for instance, Bernard Bell wrote, remember the time or help, right? Remember the time, just like he wrote kissing game and, you know, those things, you know, he doesn't necessarily get the credit he should have gotten, you know? So, that used to happen a lot back in the days, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, there's so much we're going to when we get into um, your career and your group yeah. and, and and being in the midst of of, of the whole uh, New Jack Swing uh, revolution and and things. Um, but I just just finally, it, Shelby, anything else that you picked up from DOA before we we we, we, we interview our special guest? That was the thing that stood out. But again. Like Stevie said, as far as just having those great stories, because sometimes some people, as the time goes on, they forget a lot of stuff. They forget yeah. a lot of stuff. So for him to really just have that that recall, it makes for a great you know interview and makes you want to go back and listen to it again. I was checking out his um, YouTube channel as well. He's got his the playlist and yeah, there's, there's some recent footage of a Chucky Booker concert that he did i think it was just before christmas yeah need to watch that. it's edited but just to see chucky book alive is just amazing just, he's still got yeah. the voice so yeah check out derek's uh youtube channel the playlist yes dear yeah so he and chucky are best friends and chucky formed university part two right um, and um so derek plays the bass so they're, they're, they're always playing stuff together Chucky's came to the UK with Lionel Richie, so he went. You know, he he was the music director with Lionel Richie and the, and and the uh, Rhythm Nation tour buddies. So when Lionel Richie came to the UK to play at the King's Coronation party, Chucky flew out there. Um, but um, they always didn't. Yeah, he's like, no, I'm not. I'm you know, he wanted him on bass, but he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not traveling right now. But um, yeah, I, the one thing I would always say, I probably interviewed over a hundred guests. And it isn't the size of the, it isn't the name of the guest that makes the interview. It's actually the, the personality. 
Yeah. And one of the things about DOA is that he was an amazing storyteller, the way he just got into it. And so people who didn't really know him were just were falling in love with how he was just telling a story and going back and he was being visualized, visualizing everything. And because um, when he talked about um, Bobby saying, um, bringing, bringing in Whitney Houston, and he was like, yeah, produced, and he was like, I don't know what to do. And and you could just feel, I almost if this was a, tel- a TV movie, I could just visualize the whole thing. So that's that's the one thing that you can get is a great guest who can, um, I can't say the names of some of my big guests who were really sort of hard to bring out their personality and really made the interview quite a challenge. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, no, no pressure on. on I spent two minutes, yeah. no pressure at all. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, we we can go in and start off with you, uh, Idris. I mean, you know, for those because you know we we do have an international audience, so we always like to to start off with to know where you're sort of born and raised, so people have an a, a, an idea. Okay, um, so I was born I was born in New York, uh, Manhattan, actually, and. Um, both of my parents were in the music industry. A lot of people don't know that. Both of my parents, my dad was a famous jazz drummer, Idris Mohammed Sr. Uh, oh. And my mom. And, and yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, then my, and my mom, I'm, I'm my mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so my mom was the lead singer of a group in the 60s called The Crystals. So her, her, her hit song was The Do Run, Run, Run. To do run run you know and so yeah so i was kind of like born in the music industry um miles davis was my godfather so we would have um my dad would have and so so i was born in new york and then we moved to teaneck new jersey and so the great thing about teaneck new jersey is it's next to two other two other cities one is inglewood and one is hackensack and inglewood and hackensack especially inglewood so if you know Teaneck, that's Isley Brother country. Isley Brothers uh-huh. come from the Teaneck, New Jersey, um, where Inglewood you have today, the group today, you have Redhead Kingpin, and then you have the outskirts of Inglewood, you have uh, Alpine and Closter. Now in Alpine, you have Stevie Wonder. Um, in Inglewood, you have Sugar Hill Records. Um, in Inglewood, you have Regina Bell and Bernard Bell. And so, all and so at the time i'm talking about mid 80s mid 80s where you know all hip hop and things of that nature used to come from new york and so people used to sleep and, and, and it's so ironic is because even though the hip hop used to come from new york sugar hill records was the first record label to put out an album and they're from jersey they're jersey uh-huh. right and so inglewood is the next town from teaneck um inglewood was a little bit rougher so redhead kingpin um was my childhood friend wow. and david yeah Red, <laughs> yeah david we used to call him uh david cuppy david guppy the redhead puppy that's, <laughs> that's what we would call him and so he was about two years younger than i was da- uh, david uh redhead was uh his mother was a police officer i think she made it to police chief or something like that in Inglewood. Wow. but but um so i st- i started off with uh david Wynn. Um, David Wynn, whose name at the time was DJ Sky, had um, like, I think if my memory serves me correctly, four or five brothers that they all used to rap, but they were rapping in the time of like um, Grandmaster Flash and those. So they were his older brothers. And so me, I was uh, about, I was younger at the time. And I, at the time I had made a name as a rap. So let me rewind. So I wanted to get into the music industry and my parents didn't want me to because they said it wasn't stable. So what they did is they said, you know, if you get your education, you go to school, you get your degree and whatever, you can get into the music industry. And like living in Teaneck, New Jersey, you never know. It's like, well, you say it's not it's not stable, but we, you know, I never wanted for anything. Teaneck is a great place to live. It's in Bergen County, which is the richest state in in in, in New Jersey. So I'm like, okay, so Ironically, my parents sent me to school in England. So I went to oh. school in England. I actually went to school in Bury. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this right. right away from me. Right. Yeah. I went to I went to school in, I went to school in Bury. Um, um, and uh, it was a I'm Muslim, so it was a Muslim school. 
What year was that? Um, It was in like the early 80s, sort of like 83, 80, 83, 82, 83, something like that. Yeah. And so I went there for like four years. I would come home every summer and um, got my degree after, you know, back then you had to take your O levels and A levels. Right. And so 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 then I get back home from school and I say, okay, dad, I want to dive into the music industry. He's like, okay. At that time, my dad was playing for Roberta Flack. So my dad, um, yeah, he was playing for Roberta Flack. Um, so my dad started off playing for Sam Cooke. And um, then he went to uh, the Impressions, uh, Curtis Mayfield. Then after that, he was playing for uh, James Brown. And but that's his story. Anyway, so anyway, I get back from I get back from from England and I say I want to dive into the music industry. And he says, OK, so I'd start rapping and things of that nature. And um, I at the time and nobody can refute this at the time, Inglewood, Inglewood, Hackensack and Teaneck would always have these parties. I was the baddest, the coldest MC in all three cities, the coldest. Um, and so David Wynn saw me battling Biz Marquis one day in Teaneck, wow. New Jersey. Yeah. And I, I, it was Biz Marquis and TJ Swan. And I had a beatbox at the time. His name was Dion Perkins. Um, and I killed him. And so David Wynn, I'm, I'm about three years younger than David Wynn. David calls me. He's like, yo, dude, you know, I'm, I'm getting this group together. And it was me, him, and another rapper named um, MC Norm. And, he, and so we, we made a group called The Move. And so we had like one, one song out. It's on YouTube. And then after that, now all this time, David is like two years younger than me. And he's like following me all around. And we're good, we're good friends. And like, so when you're two years younger, two or three years younger, it seems like you're five years younger. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you get what I'm saying at like 15, 15, 17. And so he would always follow me around and he hadn't kind of like grown into his, 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 I would say his uh, style yet. Mm-hmm. And he would follow me around and things of that nature. The next thing you know, he gets a deal with Gene. And so let me rewind it back. So big bub is part of today. So today was signed to Gene. Yeah. But today had a group called the Gents before they signed with Gene. And in that group, Bernard Bell was in, to, was in that group. And so Gene, if my memory served me correctly, gave them the name today is because I think he said that, you know, that name never goes out of style. It's always today. Right. If, 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 I, if, I, if I'm if I uh, if I got the story wrong, please forgive me. But um, so they got signed first to Gene. And then I think Redhead got signed to Gene. And so when Redhead got signed, I would hang with Red. And um, at the time, Rex and Effect had put out a first album. Um, and then I think B Dogs got killed. And on that first album, uh, Scoop, Scoop, uh, Scoop Lover, who is now Fat Man Scoop now. Um, uh, he did say he was with uh, the, the yeah, back fa- in the day. Fat Man Scoop, uh, Scoop, his name was Scoop Lover. And he was on like a single, um, a song on um, Rex and Effects' first album. And so, so I got on. So, so if it wasn't for Redhead, I probably wouldn't have gotten to the business that that uh, that heavy. And so it was between Redhead and another man named T.C. Tompkins. Uh, you have to look him up. <laughs> T.C. Tompkins. T.C. Tompkins had two daughters, and his two daughters were, was Rochelle and Michelle. And they lived in Teaneck. And T.C. Tompkins was the vice president, I think, of marketing for Epic at the time. And I swear, T.C. Tompkins had Michael Jackson at his house because Michael was signed to Epic. Right. (laughs) And so and so like Michelle and Rochelle, which is which are his daughters, they would be like, well, Michael Jackson was at our house and we'd be like. Yeah, right. You know, we'd be like, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, this is Michael Jackson off the wall, Michael Jackson. And this is Michael Jackson, thriller Michael Jackson. And so T.C. Tompkins, um, uh, Michelle and her sister, mostly Michelle, 
that them and Redhead got me down with Gene. And when I got on board, um, it was about it was the almost the beginning of the breakup between Gene and Teddy. And that's a completely different story. I mean, and so what would happen was Teddy uh, when when, when uh, Redhead was like, because I had already signed, and Re and Redhead was like, "Yo, bro, um, you know, Gene is Gene and Teddy is splitting up," um, and he was like, "I don't know if I'm gonna go with Gene," and I'm like, "Well, I've already signed," and he was like, "All right," he, and um, and so then we had moved. Gene was moving to Atlanta at the time, and uh, Teddy was supposed to move to Atlanta, and so was a. Uh, Gene had bought Teddy and Damien a house and it, it was in Virginia and he had bought, they were going to move to Virginia first, but then they moved to Atlanta. And, um, next thing you know, it was around the holiday season. Uh, they were breaking up the, the whole GR productions were breaking up. So like, that's how I knew spec in them because spec and mucho and KB were the backup band for today. And, um, and Daryl Dizo was a drum tech for God. And, um, and so this is the thing that Gene would do. This is the kind of stuff Gene would do. If Gene would find and see an artist that was amazing, he would sign you and put you on the shelf, right? And so what Gene did with Dizo is, okay, Gene, Dizo had a group with a guy named Dinky and Aaron Hall. They were in a group before- Hold on, hold on, stop there, stop there. <laughs> what? We're only mm. just finding this information out that there was a group <laughs> with Aaron Hall, Dinky Bingham, mm -hmm. and Diesel. So this, yeah. we, we, they we, would they would they would sing together. Those three would sing together, right? Um, and and I think uh, you know Diesel used to say Aaron was his cousin, and Aaron would say Diesel was his cousin. But I don't know if they're fully related, but that's what they would say. So Dinky, Aaron, and Diesel would sing in church together, and they formed a group. I don't know if they were. I don't think that they were, you know, recorded or anything like that, but they mm -hmm. sing together. Um, and at the time, Teddy had men at work. And this is before, this is around the time of the show, around Dougie Fresh. And so when Aaron, when uh, Timmy Gatlin left, or got, I don't want to say left, when he, <laughs> when, when he wasn't in Guy anymore, let me clear that up because I know he didn't leave. <laughs> um, when he wasn't in Guy anymore, they got Damien. And Damien was down with Guy. And then Dizo, Gene signed Dizo because Dizo sounded a lot like Aaron. So Gene signed Dizo so he wouldn't mess with Aaron. And so Dizo, he signed him and he put him as a drum tech. So wherever Guy went, Dizo was a drum tech. And, um, and so that's how, so then when the breakup between Teddy and Gene happened, then Gene had Diesel signed. Cause see, D Diesel was a solo artist and so was I. I was signed as a solo artist. And so the funny thing Gene would do is he would, whoever, you know, whoever he had at the time, sometimes he would put them together. You get what I mean? So Diesel was a solo artist. I was a solo artist signed as a solo artist. When the breakup came about, Gene took the basic black and they were down in Atlanta and um, Gene had put, Diesel with Basic Black, and that's how Basic Black came about. Um, but basically, they already had the name. They had the name like years before. Mm -hmm. They they it was a uh, K it was KB Speck and Mucho, and then they they had like um, a girl singer. Her name was was Lucretia. Mm -hmm. She's actually a doctor right now. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah. Name is, it's not, I'm getting mixed up with Leticia. No, Lucretia. No, not Leticia. Leticia was a was a girl that Gene produced. That 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 that's a completely yeah. That's she's just she was a she was someone signed to Motown when we were on Motown. You know, she the, Gene just they just produced her. But no, this girl's name was Lucretia, and she was Asian. I think she was Korean. If she wasn't Korean, may God forgive me. But I think she was she was Asian, and um, she played keyboards. And when the black came up, um. They were the backup band for today, and Lucretia was going to be the lead singer. And then they found Dizo, and then Lucretia wasn't the lead singer anymore. She went back down to Columbus, and she's doing well for herself now. I think she's a she's a doctor. Um, yeah. So so that's how the Black formed down there. And so and so when the breakup started, I 
went to Atlanta um, and Redhead stayed and went solo. Um, and see what people don't fit, what people fail to realize, and I don't think anybody will dispute me when I say this, when Gene left Teddy or when Teddy left Gene, let's make that clear. When Teddy left Gene, Gene started losing all of his, all of his uh, deals. Okay, wow. so there was a guy named Artie Hoyle, Timmy Arthur. His name is Timmy Arthur. He was signed to Virgin. And then Zan, Zan a man, was signed to Warner Brothers. Hold on, Timmy Arthur was signed to Virgin. Yes. As a solo artist. As a solo artist. We're getting some gems today. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Timmy start. Arthur, Timmy Arthur was signed to Virgin as a solo artist. He had his album, his album was done. Oh my gosh. So he who was produced, signed. Who produced it? Him. Because I know Timmy Arthur produces Timmy Arthur and okay. So I don't you'd have to, you know, you got to get in contact with Timmy because. When when I say Timmy Arthur and when I say Artie Hoyle, it's the same guy. Okay. Oh, right. So Artie Hoyle is the guy with me on that album. That the same guy. And so Timmy Arthur played, produced, produced his own album. He had help from Zan. Timmy Arthur's album was done. When I went to Atlanta in 90 or 90, yeah, 90, I remember this clearly. Okay, so I got picked up at Hartsfield Airport in Atlanta. And Gene picks me up in this uh, 750 BMW, I think it was the black one. He picks me up and he, he um, I'm in the front seat and he puts a tape in. And I hear this song called I've Been Waiting and it's by Timmy Arthur, but Diesel is on it. And I'm like, I thought you and, I said, that's Aaron? I said, that's Aaron? And he says, no, that ain't Aaron. I said, who's that? And he said, that's Diesel. I said, you joking. I said, he sounds just like Aaron. And he said, yep. And I said, holy shit. That's what I said. I was like, so, so, so Timmy Arthur, I hope he still has him. He has a song with Dizo. The song is called I've Been Waiting, but Timmy Arthur's singing all the lead and Dizo's just doing like ad libs. Oh, this is crazy. Stuff. It's crazy, right? And so, yeah, Timmy, Timmy's album was finished. He was, he was on Virgin. So what happened was Gene was losing all his deals. When Teddy left Gene, he was losing his deals. So when he Teddy left Gene, Zan, Warner Brothers, stopped promoting Zan. He stopped promoting ah, Zan. Now, now, now I understand what happened with... Well, I, I was going to get on to Zan because we, mm -hmm. we need to find this guy. Right. Long, you know, we need to find Red Ed Kingpin. Red Ed Kingpin and Zan. Where Red, are Red, they? Red Ed, Redhead but, is in Las Vegas. Um, I spoke to him some years ago, but I haven't spoken to him. The last time I tried to text Red, because I always mention his name, always. The, the last time I tried to text Red is when Eminem won, he got inducted in the Hall of Fame and he mentioned Redhead as one of his, his inspirations. And yeah. so when, when he mentioned his Redhead Kingpin, I, I text Red, I was like, yo, it, you know, Eminem just mentioned you as an inspiration, bro. And, um, but he never texts me back. So I don't know where Red is. Last time I heard he was in Las Vegas. Um, now, I'm sorry, real quick, because you mentioned Zan. Yeah. Now, and I was looking at the credits on your album, and there's a there's an M A card. That's no, Zan. Zan's last name is A card. That's okay. Zan. Got it. Got it. That's Got Zan. It. Okay. Yeah, that's Zan. Right. And so, and so, and so, Zan. Okay, so Zan used to date a girl that was an abstract. Her wow. name was Wanda, right? More gems. If, yeah, if you if you look at the uh, first groove, if you look at the Groove Me video, there's three girls in a row, and they're just going, they're just doing their hands like this, Groove Me, mm, yeah, right, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. that 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 is abstract. Wow, <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> That's abstract, but but um, I think I don't know, you know, why she left the group or whatever. But that was one of the admit. It was her and another girl. Um, pretty girl, Marsha, Marsha and Gary, Marsha and Gary, Marsha and Mary. Yeah, one of them, I think it was Marsha, is the one that gave Teddy a, a credit card when he when Gene left them. One of them, yeah, when, Marcia, when he yeah, left Gene, yeah. all right. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, it was, it was, it was Wanda was one, and Marsha, and the other one was another, was uh, was abstract, yeah. And so, Wanda was Zan's girlfriend. So, Gene had we used to uh, when we when everybody got signed, 
we got brought down to Atlanta and we all stayed in a house in Duluth, Georgia. It was me, the black, Zan, uh, Sprague, and Timmy Arthur. And when I say the black, I mean Spec KB, Mucho, and Diesel. Mm. Um, we stayed in Duluth, Georgia, and um, I never forget we were um, we stayed in this we stayed in this very rich um, cul-de-sac where they had a basketball a basketball um, thing at the end. It was like a dead end, and you know, brothers, we playing basketball all day, and so we go to the studio and then we play basketball by the day and go to studio at night, and so. At the time in Duluth, Georgia, you talk about 90s, you know, there was there was nothing but white people there. So um, they kind of like got us kicked out the cold. They got us kicked out the uh, the, uh, the the subdivision. And so Gene was like this. Gene was like, so y'all MFs, y'all MFs want to stay up all night? Because that's how Gene talked. He was like, <laughs> y'all MFs want to stay up all night? and Y'all want to play all night? All right. So I'm going to move y'all where you can play music lab. So he moved us down to Camp Creek where there was nothing but brothers and sisters. And it was the ghetto, and we could play our music as much as we want. We could produce, and we wouldn't have problems. Yeah. So we, we moved from there to there. And um, and so, again, I still was a solo artist. And so the Black came out. I did, uh, I, I did some writing on theirs. And then we came out. And then what Gene did is because Artie lost his deal, he put Artie with me. And then he got, there was this girl named Coco, who was a rapper. She was signed as a solo artist, and he put her, and it was me, Artie, and Coco. And then he made the name Atlanta Rap Band. Because when he said the name, I was like, this is the wackest. This, this is horrible. <laughs> um, um, and he made the name. And that's wow. how that's how it came, came about. <laughs> so he put I'm us all together. Already. I'm absolutely, you know, blown away by all this already. You know, yeah. what I'm hearing. Incredible. Because I, I, I remember buying... Mm -hmm. The art album, I remember like it was yesterday, it was a sunny morning. Back mm -hmm. then, I had $20 a week to spend. Okay. The late teen, early 20s. I'd get on the train to my city to like a, a record store that imported like soul and black music. Mm -hmm. and going in the store, and the guys knew I was in the new Jack Swing. And they, the minute they saw me, Steve, we got this for you. And, and they put the art album in my hand. And I looked to the cover, flipped it over, and I'd already got the basic black album. Right. So instantly it said like featured Diesel mm -hmm. and it's by Gene Griffin. I didn't even need to listen to it. I just went right, <laughs> I'm up with that straight away. Right. And, you know, it, it was always a mystery to me, to be quite honest. You, uh -huh. you were I you know, I know you did one, is it one video from the Yeah, and, and and I think Coco video. still has that video. I've I've been trying to find that video on YouTube, but I can't find it. So there's uh, a three second clip of it. On it a Gene is? Griffin, I'll send you the link on a Gene. Oh Griffin. yeah, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Um, but but Coco has it. Coco, she has it. Um, she has like an original. Um, so I have to get it from her. But yeah, so that is the story of of us as and so what's so funny is that when we when the album first came out, everybody was bad blood. If Gene you know, Gene and, you know, we had found out that he was steal stealing money and, <laughs> and things that I know. See, see, so this is what Gene did. We were, we were signed to Sounds of New York, right? But Signs of, Sounds of New York was si signed to Motown. And so it was a production deal that was signed plus a publishing deal. So Gene owned 75% of our publishing. <sighs> So that if you look, if you look at every single black album, if you look at well, only one black album, but if you look at every Teddy album uh, or, or the first guy album, it'll have Gene as a writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Producer and and if, you, if you look on ARB, it'll have him as a writer. Gene didn't write anything on on on. You know, how's he gonna write raps for me? You get you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so Gene didn't write anything but he puts himself as a writer because we had signed a publishing deal and the publishing deal was 75 percent of our publishing wow. and so that's that's the reason why that's the reason why um when they make the when they made the uh, new edition movie they have to get permission from donna who's gene's wife because he owns the rights to my prerogative you get what i'm saying and wow. since he's passed away, it goes to his wife. 
she yeah. she has soul soul everything. So whatever Gene did, if you if you look at Gene, if you look at the guy albums, it's his name on there. If you look at Zan's album, it's his name on there. Yeah, you, you know, it, if we get back, go back slightly. One would think that your dad was in the music business, your mom uh -huh. was in the business, you 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 your godfather's Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. They should have, you know, you've got to education one hundred and one about the industry, like so you'd know about. So when he and one people would assume that would be easy access to get into any label, anything because you've got the connections. But two, you've got people who could tell you about you know publishing and all that stuff. Or well, what was the case for yourself? Okay, so uh, I, I, I pride myself on being truthful. So, so my father. My father, my father couldn't read. My father was illiterate. My, my, my father couldn't read or write. Um, but my father was a, a musical genius. And um, I didn't find out my father could read until I was uh, 13 years old. My mother pushed education, but my father from New Orleans, he couldn't, he couldn't read. And so I found out that my father couldn't read when I was 13. We, we lived in this big house in in Teaneck, New Jersey, and it was like three stories. And um, what my dad would do would be when he would get his when he would get his record dates and his recording dates, he would have one of us write down the information. So I think I just came from school from England, and it was there for the summer. And my dad would like my dad said, "Uh, Drice, Drice," and I and I come down. And he's like, "I want you to write this down for me." So I I would this particular time. I wrote the address down for him and I was on my way back upstairs and uh, I, my mom, I'm huffing and puffing cause I'm 13. And she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what's wrong with daddy? He's always telling us to write stuff down for him. What's wrong? He can't read or something. And my mother says, no, your father can't read. And so I was like, what? And so then I started asking questions. I was like, um, well, how did he get his license? And my mother said, well, my my brother, which is my uncle, her, her brother, which is my uncle, him and my dad are the same age. So my my uncle James got him his license because back then driver's license picture pictures weren't on driver's license. <laughs> so my uncle James got him his license. So my then I would say to her, I was like, well, well, how do you guys like how do we have all this and how how do you guys like read? When you're in a restaurant with other people, my mom said, she said, well, I get the menu and I read it down. I'm like, my mom would be like, you know, oh, they have they have meatballs. Oh, no, maybe I'll get the shrimp. Oh, moment. And so my dad would know it's on the menu. And so but my dad was a, was a genius because my father was um, he was the uh, my mom and dad were in the Broadway play hair in 1969. Um, and he knew music is just that he couldn't read. And so I say that to say this, because back then you have to understand sampling and things of that nature. They hadn't made they hadn't made the laws on sampling at that time. You talk about the early 80s, you know what I mean? And so people were getting away with sampling. So so many people have sampled my dad and he not, not, never got paid for it. Now, as far as my mom is concerned, because I was born and raised Muslim, my my mom got out of the business uh, when I was five and she just raised us. And my dad stayed in the music industry. And so he wasn't savvy. He wasn't music business savvy. And one thing about that genre, and this is why I always say there's no such thing as selling out as it pertains to black music. Because when my dad was playing jazz, jazz wasn't popular. You, when, and what I mean by that is that the artists at the time weren't getting paid that much, where now most of the jazz artists are white and now they get paid top dollar. So when my dad was playing, my dad's friends were the likes of Dizzy Gillespie, Herbie Hancock and things of that nature. And I remember Herbie Hancock because my mom and my dad, I remember this argument between my parents because my 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 Herbie Hancock was like, you know, you need to get into this new wave kind of stuff. And what he meant by new wave is hip hop because they, they really did. There really wasn't a word for it at the time, you know? And mm -hmm. so, so, you know, Herbie Hancock is doing rocket, you know, all of that break dance and stuff. And my dad is like, that's a sellout. And so a lot of artists at that time 
felt that being mainstream, if you played jazz, you were selling out. And that's how my dad was. So to answer your question, when I got into the industry, because he wasn't that savvy, he can't tell me about contracts. Mm. You get what I'm saying? And my, my, my mom is out the business, but he can't tell me about this is what you need and this is what, you know what I mean? Because George Benson used to live in Inglewood. George Benson lived in Inglewood Cliffs. Um, Eddie Murphy lived in Inglewood Cliffs, Bubble Hill. Um, um, Wilson Pickett. I, I had a situation with Wilson Pickett's son where I walked in his house and beat his behind. Wilson Pickett lived in Wilson Pickett lived in Inglewood Cliffs. All of these people lived in Ingle. Uh, Whitney Houston lived in Inglewood Cliffs. And all of these people, we were all around all of these people. But when it came for me signing the contract, you know, you're young, you're 17, 18 years old. You just want to get into business. And, 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 and mind you, you're signing with Gene Griffin and Teddy Riley, who, who changed music, period. I mean, they changed the industry. I mean, everything before them was SOS Band and Freddie Jackson. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they completely changed the music industry. So it's like, I was like, I just jumped for it. And, you know, at the end of the day, you live and you learn. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned, I remember what listening to an interview with uh, Ray Parker Jr. And he was good friends with Herbie Hancock. And he he said how, you know, jazz musicians, you know, were very reluctant to cross the other side. Right. They were really proud about their stuff. Right. But Ray realized, look, man, the money, you know, right. you could dibble back and forth and stuff. So I can imagine and understand when you mentioned that, I can imagine what your dad was saying. Right. But but then at, at the time, so, you know, when, when even now, if anyone says they sent their kids to England to go to school, mm-hmm. you know, people would think, wow, you, there, there must be a lot of money around just to, you know, to do that. Most Americans were hardly leaving their state, not to talk of moving country to send their kids to school. Right. Right. So was, was your dad, at least regardless of the business side, he was still able to be. Well, we, we, we were well off. We, we did well. Um, the only thing is that, oh, you know how um, you know how they always say that uh, if you're making a million, that means the other person is making like five. A Don King kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, I mean, you know, we were we were doing well, um, but you know, other people were doing better, you know? And um, when my parents sent me to school in England, they sent me to a Muslim school. Okay. And um, and so, you know, then I got out of that Muslim school and went to regular school, but um, it was a religious school they sent me to at first. And so, uh, yeah, and, and so, because my parents did a lot of traveling in England. See, my mom, my mom was signed as Phil Spector. So, <laughs> well, so okay. yeah, Phil Spector. So Phil, she wasn't Motown. She was Phil Spector. So Phil Spector, she had a lot of uh, white fans. So the Crystals, they had a lot of white fans. And so they toured England a lot. The Crystals and my dad toured, my dad toured Europe a lot because of jazz. Mm-hmm. And so they were very familiar with Europe. As, as a matter of fact, now, um, both of my sisters are married to people from Europe. One of them passed away, but, you know, so my family, uh, my, my brother and I went to school in England and then my two sisters went to school in Vienna, Austria. So my, my, my brother and I speak uh, fluent, my brother and I speak fluent Urdu, Gujarati and Hindi. And then my sisters speak fluent German. Wow. My because goodness. in England there, as you, you know, there are a lot of Indians and Pakistanis. Yeah. Um, and so we learned the language. And so mm-hmm. then when my parents moved to Austria, my sisters, they speak fluent German. And so my, my parents knew England. My parents knew Europe very well. Sheldon, what, what, what do you want to know about his dad? Well, his father is a great drummer um, and his mother um, with, with, with the Crystals. I, ju- I yeah. watched an interview with your mom, Street Light, huh? excellent interview. Okay. Excellent. She shared a lot of great stories, a lot of insight during the time when it was a lot of heavy racial stuff going on. And she was yeah. one of the few people in that time who was actually just really standing up against that that movement at the time. So yeah, very yeah. great interview. Yeah, my mom, my mom, which is very ironic, is because Di- Deanne Warwick has a, a something out now where she tells a story 
but she tells it wrong. It was actually my mom's story. What 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 happened was it was Dion. It was Dion. And so, so so from my mom being from Brooklyn, she never really knew about racism like the racism in the South. Okay, and so my mom I think was about thirteen or fourteen, and Dion Warwick was uh, older than her. And so my mom said that her and they were they were they were touring with Sam Cooke, and um, Dion and my mom went to his to a store to get a tuna fish sandwich, and um, and so when they went to get a tuna fish sandwich, the waitress lady said, "Y'all can't eat here, y'all can't eat here." And my mom, being from Brooklyn, she's like, "What are you talking about?" She's like, "Here, take the menu, go outside, and um, come back and tell us what you want." When she said, "When she said take the menu," she threw the menu at my mom, and my mom threw the menu back at her. When she threw the menu back at her, the menu hit the white lady on the chin. Dion Warwick grabs my mom and runs, wow. and they run back to the sound check where Sam Cook is doing the sound check. And um he says he, they tell my mom, my mom tells Dion, Dion tells my mom, I mean Dion and my mom tells uh, Sam, Sam hides him under the stage. And then next thing you know, this big uh this this cop comes to the venue and says, uh yeah, uh where that little nigga gal at? And uh, Sam is like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, where that where's that little nigga gal at? And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, okay, I'll tell you what. As soon as you finish the show, get out of town. Go to the next town. And so that night, my mother said that Sam Cooke, because he was so upset, that night he started, that, that back then they had a line in between the black people and the white people. <laughs> and he said that night, my mom said that night, Sam Cooke started just singing to the black side. And the white side were mad and started throwing stuff at him. And then when they left that night, Sam Cook said to my mom, who's much younger, he said, um, you, know, you know why I did that? He said, I did that is because of the way that they, they treat us. And so, you know, my mom tells, I, I asked my mom, I got books and things of things that my mom tells me about the 60s. My dad told me a story where he, him, him he was in the South with Joe Jones or somebody like that. And, um, he said they pulled over to go get some gas. And back then, you know, the, the, they got their gas pumped. Someone pumped their gas for them. Mm -hmm. So he said one of the, his friends went to go drink some water. And the, 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 the guy that pumps the gas says, hey, you, you don't drink that water. It's not good for you. And the guy's like, he said, it'll give you a headache. And the guy's like, how's this water going to give me a headache? He said, don't drink that. I'm telling you, it'll give you a headache. And he says, oh, whatever. And he goes and drinks the water. The white parking attendant hits him on the head with a hammer. Light. He hit him light, but he hit him. He hits him and he says, I told you that water will give you a headache. Don't drink that damn water. And so, like, those are stories. I mean, my, my dad tells me stories about Little Richard and things like that. And it's just amazing stories that I've learned from both my parents. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you're right. She does. She, she was a, she's paved the way for a lot of us, a lot of our artists now. You know what I mean? The things that they went through has paved the way for a lot of the artists now. I mean, we we see we see racism here and now nowadays. And, you know, and, and you know, it's just I'm not saying it's just as bad, but, you know, they paved the way for for a lot of us. So we need to be very, very, very grateful for for all of them. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, when you think about what they experienced um, in the 60s um, yeah. and, and stuff, but then when you think about what black artists were experiencing in the late 80s and the 90s with the likes of a Gene Griffin, a Suge Knight, um, um, what's the guy out in um, Solar Records, Dick Griffey? Dick Griffey, Dick Griffey. Yeah. Where, yeah, and, and so then you start realizing that actually um, – was it any better, you know, where you, you get in into the business and, you know, they, you're, you're getting, they're taking 75% of your hard work. I mean, for, 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 you know, but for yourself, was it always being a hip hop, a writer, hip hop? You didn't, you weren't a musician, you weren't singing. Was it just hip hop? No, no, no. I play about? also, I play, I play uh, drums. Um, but it's always been, I've, I've always been a writer, you know, I've, you know, a lot of times when people start off rapping, they end up writing songs. And so, you know, I've always been into writing. 
and things of that nature. And a lot of the reasons why I was into writing is because when I found out that my father was, um, when I found out my father couldn't read growing up, I have, I suffer from dyslexia. Oh, and okay. so, yeah. So what I, what I, what would happen with me is I would see words backwards. Right. Wow. And so, so the only way to get over the things like that is if you, if you attack your fears. And so I started writing to attack my fear, you know, because I suffer from dyslexia. Um, and so it's more so writing and things of that nature. And, and one thing about my dad is um, I learned how to play the drums on my own. My dad wouldn't teach me because he didn't want me to get into the business, you know? And you know, you, a lot of times you want to be what your parents are. You get me into your, 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 your father's a lawyer, your father's a doctor. You may want to do that. You know what I mean? Your, your, yeah. your, par your parents are your, your heroes, so to speak. But um, he never wanted to teach because he never wanted me to play because I guess he felt that it wasn't as stable as, as it should have been, mm -hmm. you know? And I think it goes back to, you know, and, and let me be clear, just because my dad couldn't read, it doesn't mean he couldn't learn. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, hurt people hurt people, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so that's why you have the stories of the Dick Griffiths and the, the Gene Griffins. If you, if you look at their pasts, like if you look at a Dick Griffey, I don't know his story really, but if you look at a Gene Griffin, you know, he had a very bad past. You know, I know Gene Griffin was in jail. You know, I don't know about a Dick Griffey, but I know Gene Griffin was in jail. So they have past. So a lot of times when you do things, like when you, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you live from survival, then that's how you treat people. You treat people like you take advantage of people when you live. There's two ways to live out of love and survival mode. When you live James out of Brown love. James Brown did that. Right. James. Mm -hmm. Right. So you live out of survival mode. So when you live out of survival mode, you're always looking around your shoulder and you're thinking like somebody's going to take advantage of you. Not knowing that if you give a person their just due, then they'll stick around longer and yeah. they'll be down. You know what I mean? And, 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 and this goes on to, to, to today. The only thing that's helping a lot of these artists is the internet. You know what I mean? Um, in some aspects. I mean, the streaming thing is, is, is a different story. But, you know, I'm talking about when it comes to record labels. You know, because, I mean, I'm going I'm to be honest and say that, you know, Gene did, Gene messed over Teddy. Teddy messed over the people he hang with. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, I keep it 100. You know what I'm saying? I keep it, I'm not in the business no more. So I don't have anything to hide. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's it's unfortunate. Hurt people hurt people, you mm. know, and, and, and that's the way, you know, we as people of color need to start reading our contracts if we get them and start. And we need to, you know, I, I, I love the movement now of, you know, you know, putting out your own material and things of that nature. And I, and I know that a lot of artists are getting more money that they, than they got in the 80s and 90s. And, and I applaud that. But still, if these rappers and things are getting big money, what do you think the streaming companies are making? It's that mm -hmm. simple. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what, what, what I, year did you Okay. Sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to find out what year did you sign with um GR Productions? 90. Okay. So had Redhead come out with um Do the Right Thing by the, by the time you signed right. Do the right thing do the right thing came out in like 89 yeah, 90. Yeah it was 89. Yeah. Um and so so do the right thing came out. So so that's good. That's a good because you know, do the right thing was was originally written for that movie. Okay, the Spike Lee movie. Right, yeah. the Spike Lee movie. Because Gene was good for that. Is because like our album on our album, New Jack City, that was written for the movie New Jack City, but it didn't get picked up. So do the right thing that Redhead made was written for the movie Do the Right Thing, but it never got picked up and put on the put on the soundtrack. And so Bub sang, Bub sang the background on Do the Right Thing. And so that's around the time I got signed. Okay. But I was going to wonder, because this is Redhead, your, your buddy. That's my His buddy. song was an international hit. I mean, I was oh, in yeah. Nigeria when that came out. What did you, did you, did you, were you surprised how big it blew up? And, you know. Yeah. So this is the funny thing. Like we all, we just call them, you know, Dick. So, okay. So you, you, you think you got to back in the 80s, right? You got a kid with red hair. I mean, bright red <laughs> hair, right? He used to get teased a lot, right? But he used it to his advantage, right? And 
when he, I forget his rapping name at first, but then what happened was he started to listen to a lot of Big Daddy Kane and things of that nature. And Redhead was a, was a barber. And so he would cut his own hair. Wow. And so when Big Daddy Kane came out, he started cutting his hair into a flat top because before that he had it in a small afro. And so when he cut it into this flat top, he kind of got this personality. Plus he was a rapper, right? And he started marking. So when Gene saw him, he was like, yo, this is instant. I'm marketing this dude for his hair. It's, 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 it's easy math. His name mm -hmm. wasn't Redhead at the time. He changed it. I know Gene didn't change it. I know he changed his name from something else to Redhead Kingpin. And when he changed his name to Redhead Kingpin, he took on that persona. And so to answer your question, when he, when he blew up, he was still David Guppy to me. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like, but, but this is the thing. Red never got, he never got um, an ego, never. And Red, what people don't know about Red is that Red at the time could, produ could produce just as good as Teddy. People didn't know that. He shown that on his second album, though. Right. Actually. On his second album, a lot of the production was done by him. Um, right. And, and, and he produced the Big Bub single, I Don't Mind. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, so he, he did the Eminem album as well. Yeah, he did. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, the Eminem album of two girls. So it's like he could produce just as good as Teddy. And so, one thing about Teddy back then, you know, it's like Teddy was Teddy. He, you know, he had a lot of work, a lot of work. And, um, you know, when you when you do something like Teddy did and like Timbaland did, you change a whole music genre. You're gonna have so many people that want to use you, use you to do their production, and so Ted, is Teddy just, he just, you know, sometimes I would see, think he would get overwhelmed because at that time he didn't have a production team; it was just Teddy, and then Redhead was doing production, and then Zan, the man, I don't know if you know these fun facts, but I don't know. I think Zan had something to do with last night a DJ saved my life. Um, because wow, that was Gene's that's, record. that's Gene's record. And I think mm -hmm. Zan had something to do with that. I think he might've wrote it or whatever. And you know, Zan wrote why you get funky on me, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay. So that was around. If you know, we need to find Zan because he can tie a lot of, of yeah. together as well. <laughs> but was, so, was, was that Zan wrote it, but that sounds so much like a Teddy production though. Which one? What? No, yo, why you get was funky? Not, no, wow. that's Zan. Yes, but I was there. I, that, that song was done in Atlanta. And I'm going to tell you what happened. Gene. If you hear the soundtrack on the House Party soundtrack, it yeah. does sound much, much. It sounds a lot like why you get it. The production is so similar. So know? that, that was Zan, that, that was Zan saying, Zan said that he, that's what he would say. He would be like, why you get funky on me? Meaning like, you know, why you dissing me? That was Zan saying. Zan produced that track. Zan wrote that track. I think uh, um, maybe Mucho and Artie helped, but that's Zan all day. If you notice, you hear Gene, you hear Bub say, you know, Gene, I wonder why all these, that he says Gene because, because Teddy and them were breaking up, right? Mm -hmm. and, and Gene flew Big Bub down to Atlanta. The rest of them are not on the background. That's not today on the background of why you get funky on me. That's Zan. Daryl and Artie. Wow. Wow. And 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 Bub. That's not that's not West Chief of Love. I love them though. They're my they're my angle with peeps, but they are not on the vocals, background vocals of why you're getting funky on me. That's Zan, Artie, and I think Bub. And what so about your, hmm? what about your group though? We need to what? hear about your group. What um, about them? well you're in the midst of New Jack Swing. Right. You've just been formed. You've just been put together in this group. Mm -hmm. What are your memories? I've Just take, take out all the, the business side of it. What are mm -hmm. your memories of, you know, rapping on it, the production, how you felt about it? Quite honestly, I mean, I was signed as a solo artist. So, you know, I, I was just happy to be in a mix, you know, um, like, so... You know, Teddy and them were Teddy, and but I literally seen Gene because at the time he called it GEG, -E uh, Griffin Entertainment Group, and so I I saw like a lot of um, 
I, I saw sort of like a rebirth. I won't, I won't say, I'm not going to say, I'm, let's be clear. I'm not going to see say I saw a rebirth of New Jack Swing is because I got to get, Teddy is the creator of New Jack Swing. So I'm not going to say that. But what I will say is I saw um, the guys that I was with that had a lot of talent make some good production, some great production. Um, and that was amazing. Like the Artie Hoyles, I mean, Timmy Arthur, Zan the Man, uh, Mucho, you know, Speck and them, they're, they're extremely talented. So that was amazing in itself. Um, so being part of that was was amazing. Do you recall the track Jack to This that you rapped on? Because that really yeah. shook your skills off. That was a sample from Full Force. C can we play it or we're not allowed to play stuff? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that all say. But but yeah. that was a sample. That was a sample from, from a Full Force album. And see, so I was I was very lyrical. You know what I mean? And so again, to answer your question, even though I love my ARB members, I felt that I was watered down because I was I was lyrical. And so like going like going back to Jersey, I'm 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 saying this is before like Queen Latifah and Naughty by Nature and all these cats came out, you know, of Jersey like that. I mean, because you know Naughty by Nature was signed to Sugar Hill at one point, but that's another story. But but um this is before then. So it's like I was very lyrical. And so I'm like, I felt like I was watered down on being part of of the group and and Coco and, and Timmy will tell you I was hot because I was down with the black. I was, those were my brothers. When I got put together with that other group, I was just like, we're just all put together. And I just, I really wasn't feeling it. No, I just gotta be honest. I wasn't feeling it wow. because I was a solo artist and I didn't like the name. I loved, I, I liked the, I liked being in the studio, but I'm not gonna say that I loved the whole album's production. Um, because I think that we could have done better. Um, and, but for the most part, I'm glad I was there. I'm not, I don't want to feel, I don't want to sound like um, I'm sounding um, inconsiderate or uh, ungrateful because everything happens for a reason. But I, you know, sometimes you think you could, you, I think that we could have put out a better project. But at the time, Gene was put, trying to put something out right after the black is because Gene put basic black out as ind independently. So he was getting his, you gotta understand, most of his stuff was being taken away from him. So he was getting his deals back. So he was like, okay, I got this group. Okay, I got that group. I got this group. I got MGM. I got, you know what I mean? So so to answer your question, it was bittersweet. I'm sorry, I was long-winded. What happened to the mastering? Can you recall the, the, the actual mastering of the album? Because I remember playing it and thinking, Something's not right. Here. Yeah, Something it was the mix. They they mass they they I think they messed up the mix. There was too much treble. Uh, in some of the, in some of the uh, on some of the tracks, I think. But 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 it's big overseas, which is ironic to me. It's like, like in 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 the I Asian cherish, countries. Yeah. I cherish. Did you perform any? Did you perform any of the tracks live? Did you get to perform live at the time? No, no, because oh. when the black left, like I said, I was down with the when the black left, I was gone. I left with them. I, I was like, and, and, you know, it's sort of like, you know, loyalty, you know, to a fault, if you will, is because I wasn't necessarily part of basic black. They were just my guys. And like, so when mm -hmm. they left, I was gone. And so when I was gone, Gene told me one thing and I'll never forget this. He said, so you want to leave, huh? And I'm like, yeah. He said, yeah, I'll be working in McDonald's. <laughs> and I, and I said, yeah, right. But at the time, I, I didn't know that he had 75% of my publishing. So there's no <laughs> way I could get signed to anybody else. So wow. yeah, when he means that I, you, you're going to be working in, no, he said Burger King. He said, you yeah, have to be working in Burger King. What he meant is that you will not be able to sign to with anybody else. Nobody's going to touch you because you're signed to me. So, wow. is it, But can we go back to um, Nothing But A Party? I mean, absolutely. Global hit. How did you get invited to be uh, to be on that to, to do the, the rap? So uh, again, like I, you know, I was I was like the I was down with the black. So like when we moved when we moved to our we he would put us up in in these houses, right? See, we would rent a house. I would be there with them. It would be me and Timmy Arthur, and it'd be Basic Black. They we we'd all have you know two to a room, and so anything that they needed a rap on 
I would do. And so it was just, this is before Coco came around. So it was like, so basically, it was so, so like, and, 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 you know, shout out to CL Smooth and all those cats. But when, when they, when they, um, when they sent She's Mine out and it came uh. back, when it when it came back with CL Smooth and them, I felt some kind of way <laughs> because I was like, I was like, yo, I was like, you got me here, but that that's political. It was a power move, you know. Eddie F did the track, you know. Navelle, I think it was Eddie F or Navelle, yeah. the Untouchables. Mm -hmm. So of course they had their own, they had their own crew, and so CL did it. No different than when um, Letitia, the lady you were speaking about, when she did when Jean produced her track, Coco was on it. Um. So, you know, they had their, their, their in-house. So I was the in-house, I was the in-house rapper for that, for that crew. So anything that came through, I was, I was writing on it. Okay. So to answer your question, nothing but a party and stupid. And uh, still till today, I've been on two of their, two of their, two of their recent albums. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, they're, they're my guys. So it's like, I'm the first one they call. The Did what I didn't. Did you do what? any in-store signings? Did, did you actually go out and pr actually promote the album? Or did, did it just fall flat on its face? It fell flat, man, because... I, I wondered what happened. Yeah, there. it fell flat because yeah. I was done. Okay, so I'll give you an example. You remember you said you sent, you saw this thing where um, you saw the video. It was on Gene Griffin's thing. Uh, he was doing an interview. Mm. Yeah. All right, at that interview, we were there. It was me, Artie. We were there being interviewed. And I didn't answer any questions. Come on, I'm, I'm like 18 years old. I'm like, you know, st stuck on my stuff, and I'm I've left my production company. I'm I'm disgruntled. You know what I mean? And I'm not caring. Uh, so I'm like, we're getting an interview, and the two other members are answering all the questions, and I'm just sitting there. And so it was it, it, it fell flat on its face because I was I left. We all just disbanded. Yeah. Wow. You, you know, when you think back at um, at the time, because that's a very short time frame between when you joined, even when, right. when Basic Black joined, I think it was the Christmas party of 1990, where the news fizzled through that GR Productions was, uh, was broken up and Teddy mm -hmm. Edwards given everyone, released everyone so they could do, do their thing and people had to choose between camps. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I was really, you know, a big fan of Basic Black. I thought, wow, these guys could rival Guy. In fact, when I did listen to Nothing But A Party, I, I actually did think it was Guy, and I thought Teddy had produced it because it was just that good. I sh I'm sure within the camp, with the success of that track and also the fact that Motown came and picked um, picked up the album, picked up the group, there was a sense of, okay, we're, we're back on our feet. Did you then think, okay, maybe I should write up this um, our group, and and you know maybe it will, will 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 become a big thing, or was it just the fact that you just didn't think that the direction was good enough to stick with? Um, I I I was loyal, you know, um, and um, maybe hindsight is twenty twenty. You know what I mean? It's like maybe if I would have stuck around. You know, the black would have been gone, um, but maybe if I would have stuck around, you know, who was to say what could have happened as far as that part of my career was concerned. Mm -hmm. But I was loyal to them because we, we we were down together and no different that no different than when Teddy left Gene and today left Gene. And because the beef was between Teddy and Gene, not 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 today. And Gene. You know, so no different from when Teddy and Gene left. And today left, then Rex in effect left. Same thing happened with us. Um, again, um, you know, uh, I I don't know because it didn't happen that way. Uh, you know, I will say that after when when I was you know trying to get out as an artist, you know, I kind of felt it. I was like maybe I shouldn't have made that because it was every man for himself. And you got to understand when the black came out, it wasn't an album like the first guy album. You get what I'm saying? It wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was it didn't have an impact like the first guy album. And so the first guy album, you're dealing with a person that has changed music entirely. And then you're also dealing with a phenomenal producer. So the black was different. 
And if, if you ask me, uh, even Mucho, Mucho was Mucho was getting paid. The rest of them wasn't. But Mucho was getting his checks because Mucho Gene had a way of dividing conquer, <laughs> right? And so Gene pulls Mucho aside, and Mucho's doing. He did the same thing with Teddy. But I'm gonna go on record, and this people is gonna disagree with what I'm about to say. But I'm not in the business no more, so I can give my opinion. I, I, you know, Guy was a phenomenal, phenomenal group. Diesel will kill Aaron. Wow, kill him. I, I'm serious. I'm, Diesel is a different dude, man. He's got D an incredible voice. He has Diesel one. is Diesel. Okay, so Aaron. He's gonna kill me for saying this, I, it, <laughs> but I'm just saying, Aaron. Aaron has, a, Aaron has a has a, has an amazing voice. Aaron is the voice. Diesel is a he has he's a different breed, man. The stuff that Diesel you haven't heard what Diesel can do, you've not heard it, and that's a, that's a shame. And people could say you haven't heard what Aaron can do. I get that, but Diesel. There's not another diesel. There, I, I haven't heard anyone to this day that can mess with diesel, ex except for maybe, except for Stevie. Diesel will flatten. Let me tell you something, and I, this is this is straightforward. We did Motown Soul by the Sea. If you could try and find it, I on remember YouTube. it was on the B the broadcast okay. on the BBC. Yo, Stevie Wonder told Diesel. You a bad boy. But we saw we did Motown Soul by the Sea. And at the end, there's this song that the Temptations were singing called Soul to Soul. And Big Bub, all of us, everybody was grabbing the mic. D Big Bub grabbed the mic and he sang his sang. He sang his thing. Diesel towards the end grabbed the mic and he just killed it. He's an amazing, he's he's amazing. I mean, and I mean, I like, I, I, you know, people might say that, you know, because I'm from that camp, blah, blah, blah. I get it. I get it. I get it. But that's a, that he's an amazing he's 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 amazing. So that's just me. <laughs> yeah. And I know I mean, I'm going to get flack. I know I'm going to get flack. I know I'm going to get flack. <laughs> can, can I throw another name? Can I throw a, a, another name out here? Uh, yeah. And see if you knew anything about it. It's like a holy grail. Who? New Jack Swing, an album. By a group called Edification. Does that? Yeah, ring absolutely. Bell? Okay. I spoke, I spoke to Artie Hoyle many years ago. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a copy of that album. I know he produced it. You know, he did a lot of stuff on it. So Edific what, Edification was about to be on Commission's ass. That's how good Edification was. Wow. Edification, edification was signed, was signed to AM. They were signed to AM. And, and, and Artie Hoyle. I think Mucho did some tracks on the Edification album. Um, yeah, they were they were amazing. Gospel group, yeah. You know, you know, so many people came through that camp and Gene turned them down. You know, Arrested Development came through that camp and Gene turned them down. Dallas came through the camp before he got with Joy Spinderella. Gene turned them down. Who is so, this? Who is another name for you? Who is Z Muta Mutaz? That's Gene. This <laughs> <laughs> album is. I'm thinking, who is who? Because he's no, on. that's Gene. Gene. Wow. Gene. Gene. Gene changed his name. It's Gene. <laughs> Z Mutez. That's G. Now you said you said earlier you have certain podcasts that's going to blow. That's going. <laughs> this is going to be one of them. That's Gene. Gene is Z Mutez. Because he was taking people's credit, so he changed his name from, from Gene Griffin <laughs> to Z Mutez. That's well, Gene. You can't see that. Do you remember <laughs> these guys? Mind. I don't know if you can see that. That's made by man. Mind. Yes. That's, that's Zeno, um, Billy, and um, Steve. Steve, beware. The name is Mind. M I N E M I N D. Another Gene Griffin. Thing okay, that. but but let me tell you, let me tell you a mind story. Okay. Okay. Now I'm telling you, I'm telling you some jewels now. Okay. <laughs> so mind is from Detroit. One of the one of the members from mind. Actually, mind mind's name used to be made by man. Okay, so they changed their name from made by man to mind. 
Okay, Gene made that name up. The reason why he said made the reason why the name was made by man is because if you remember the remix of Rex and Effect, yeah. there's a part where Teddy's like, everything is made by man. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So the name was made by man. And then Gene changed it from made by man to mind. It was it was called MBM. They were called MBM first. They changed the name from made by man to mind. This is before they came to Atlanta. One of made by man i think it might be billy or steve i don't know steve beware or billy one of those guys is zan's cousin okay when zan when gene started working with basic black zan got put on the shelf Z, gene started putting more more um more attention on the black zan got mad zan left gene when Zan mm -hmm. left Gene, Made by Man got signed to Gene with this song called Tell Me What You Want to Do. And Zeno, Zeno is an amazing singer. He sounds like uh, the guy from Tony, Tony, Tony. Him, He sounds like him and Stokely. That's, what, that's his tone. Okay. All right. So Zeno, they had this thing called Tell Me What You Want to Do. Tell Me What You Want Me to Do. Right? It's a mid-tempo. Tell me what you want me to do. So when Zan went and left Gene, he went to Teddy and he took Zeno's demo. Guess what song they that's that that song on the new guy album is? Tell me what you, that song, tell me what you want me to do. Yes. They took he took he took Teddy took tell me what you want me to do and made um the song on uh, the guy album, uh, uh, "Dog Me Out." Oh, the, the future <laughs> album. Yeah. Yep. It's not the originals. Not 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 the remix. Okay. Why well, which, you which dog one? Me out. Which, which the, one is the, the one? Which the original one, which, one with the George the George Clinton sample was the original. The the original I mean, one the heavy D that, that heavy D's rapping on. That's do me right. Oh, you mean do me right? Do me right. Do me right. Do me right. I just wanna do the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because okay, so so the Zeno song went like this: Girl, tell me what you wanna do. I don't have time to spend these silly games with you. I want you. You want me. Love was meant to be. That's how it went. And so, D uh, Zan took that because he was mad at Gene, brought it to Teddy. Teddy took it and made "Do Me Right." Wow! Took the so they took the whole the whole all his all Aaron is saying we went it together. Same melody, same music, and everything. Teddy took it. You can call. You can ask Zeno now. He may he may not want to speak about it because he's out the business. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, 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 I don't care. You know, this is this is the thing. You know, we all get inspired by other people. You know what I mean? Mm. You know, just give a man his credit. Just give that group their credit. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. So, mind is Zeno, Billy, who Billy went on to do some great things. Billy produced Return of the Mac with Jamie Fox. Oh. Okay. Wow. okay. And he and he also produced um. Uh, T shirt and panties for uh with Jamie Foxx for um for uh Adina Howard. His name is Billy Moss. Billy yeah. Moss. Yes, that's the other guy from the group. Yeah. The question Billy came Moss. in from Robert Brown asking any info on uh, Pretty in Pink track all about you. Um that was an Artie track. Artie did that. Or Timmy Arthur did that. What does he want to know? I mean, you know, yeah. So, who produced it, and what, what was the? I mean, could the girls sing? So, what That's happened was Khan's. that was one of Chaka Khan's family members. Oh, She's I, I don't think it now. A mirror, yeah, I think that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily know the story of them, but I do know that uh, Gene did write that. Oh. Um, but um, Gene had a way of writing where he couldn't write hooks; he would just. This is what I want you to say. If you listen to, if you listen to the New Jack City on my on my album, right, you'll notice that there's no hook on there. 
all he's saying is New Jack City, New Jack City. And all he's saying is uh, everyone in the corner. And they're just singing through the whole thing. There's no hook. You get what I'm saying? So Gene had a way. Gene couldn't write. I'm not going to say he couldn't write hooks. I'm going to say he had, he would just say, sing this and sing that and, you know, sing that and sing. And, but sometimes there would be like, it would, wouldn't have any structure, you know? Um, so Gene wrote all of that. And what would happen was, would be Artie would, would make it into a song. Gene would tell him what he want and Artie would make it into a song. Mm. Now, 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 let me rewind, let me rewind and say, you know, you know, have you ever seen, okay. I'm not going to compare these two is because it's very controversial, but have you ever seen uh, Schindler's list? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever seen the part where the guy says, I'm making all the money. I'm, I'm doing all of this. What do you do? And then what's the name says, I, I sell pizzazz. Stop. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Gene. <laughs> so that's my favorite movie of all time. That, so that, I, that, I, I, yeah. So that that's Gene. You know what I'm saying? The, he, yeah. he, he's just the show, you know, pizzazz style. Yeah, okay. that that's 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 what he does. You yeah. what I'm saying? So, meet, when did you meet Usher? Oh, you sort of you sort of thing. Um, I met Usher as a chef. So I, I'm an executive. So what I did is I took all the people, all of the contacts that I know in the music industry, and I just reverted them to food. So I, I'm an executive chef now. So so I met Usher through someone. Okay, so so there's a there's a lady named Marsha Glover. Marsha Glover is married to um, Usher's. Okay, Usher. If you remember, about a couple of years ago, Usher's uh, the woman that Usher was married to. Her son Ryan Glover. Yeah, Ryan Glover. Yes. So Marsha Glover is married to Ryan Glover, right? Um, Ryan Glover unfortunately lost his child when he was married to Usher's ex-wife. They're both his ex. And so Ryan Glover, uh, Marsha used to work for Neiman Marcus. I was the executive chef at Neiman Marcus. And so Marsha was like, hey, you know, I need you to come over and do something for us. And I said, okay. So I come over and I make, make, me, I make a meal for them. And who slides in but Usher? Wow. And so that's how I met Usher. And that's how I know him. And so, so you know, so like three degrees of separation. You know what I mean? So now Ryan Glover, he owns a Green Greenwood Bank, and he uh, I think he's a co CEO of uh, Bounce TV. Um, he was. I mean, I, I mean, he was back then. I don't know it now, but that's what I did. I kind of like use my music contacts because if anybody knows Ryan Glover, knows that he was part of. Uh, uh, he had a um, a record label back in the days. Um, and so he got out of the music and got into other things. And so that's how I know, that's how I met Usher. And Kasim Reed, Mayor Kasim Reed, and, and things of that nature. What did so, you do when you when when our ended then? You left, obviously. What happened then? I I I I I'm glad my parents told me to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I got a degree. I have a degree in marketing and business. So I just jumped into to what my degrees were and I just started working. And then uh, after that, I was like, you know, I want to go to culinary school. And I went to culinary school. And um, one of my first people I cooked for was Puffy, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I, I it was cool. It was good. And so, you know, I just used my contacts. And uh, I used to work at Justin's in um, in New York, and then they had a Justin's in Atlanta. And uh, shout out to Joe Rickerson; he was he was the executive chef, corporate chef. And so I just kind of like kept the people I knew close by, you know. So you ever most look of, back? Do I ever look back? No. Of what could have been, you no. know, if the situations were different. No, okay. absolutely not. And the reason why I don't is because I'm Muslim and I'm born and raised Muslim. And it is it is what's called haram. Haram means forbidden to think mm -hmm. that shoulda, woulda, coulda. Because shoulda, woulda, coulda is literally saying that God didn't have his plan. You get what I'm saying? And that and it is literally saying that if you had it in your hands, you would have did it better. No, you'll never do it better than God is going to do it for you. So I never, ever thought shoulda, woulda, coulda. I, I would say that I would um 
always tell people like don't make the same mistakes I made. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I never thought shoulda woulda coulda because shoulda woulda coulda would have never got me. You know, I it, 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 this is where you know there's a saying that says you are exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, so I don't believe in shoulda woulda coulda. I believe in you are exactly where you need to be, and God always has His plan. You just have to be patient and understand that His plan is His plan. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, it is I, I, okay. Go ahead, Sheldon. I have a question for you because you come from you know two parents yeah. who were in the music industry during the period where it was like in the music business back then. It mm-hmm. was more of a working class situation. You know, nobody mm-hmm. would nobody turned out to be millionaires. You were mm-hmm. a working musician. Absolutely. So when you look in terms of absorbing that, um, did it play any part in your um, decision to go back in the nine to five world? And what I mean by that is that there are a lot of people who have they have a lot of fame mm-hmm. for being in the music business and whatnot. And then when right. things don't things slow down for them, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily they try to stay in it for as long as they can, but they never really consider going back into the nine to five world. Well, me personally, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have a problem going. Okay. Cause I think that's a case by case basis. Okay. Because I didn't have a problem going back into the nine to five world because I wasn't that known. You get what I'm saying? If I probably was known more then I probably, it will, I will probably be reluctant because, you know, people notice me and they'd be like, Hey, what happened to you? But I wasn't reluctant because I wasn't as known as other artists probably could be or were. And so I guess it's a case by case basis. And for me, I wasn't known like that. So it didn't really bother me so too much to get back into the nine to five kind of thing. You know what I mean? So I think it's a choice that you have to make um, case by case. But then again, you got to look at um, things like um, COVID, which was the great equalizer around amongst around the world. And, you know, you found people doing things that like, yo, like they're like, look, I got to pivot. And so when it comes time to feed your family, I don't think that you should have any, any kind of arrogance or any kind of whatever you, you do. You do what you do to feed yourself and your family. You get what I'm saying? Um, so. I think it's a case by case basis. You know what I mean? Me personally, it didn't bother me that much because uh, I, I I saw this thing. I saw this thing that uh, I forget her name, but she's a comedian. And she said that Cat Williams told her she was broke. And Cat Williams said, no, you're not broke. You don't have any money. He said, because you are operating off of um, you're, you're, you're not using your talent. You're using you're using money. So once you use your talent, you'll be successful, you know? And so I think that everyone has a God gift, a talent that God has gift, gift, gifted them with. And I think that once you find that talent and you you go for that talent, you have no, there's no choice but money to come to you. Your money's going to come to you as long as you stay for it, stay, stay you know, as they say, 10 toes down. And uh, go for what you know. Um, but again, me, I didn't feel any kind of way because uh, it was something that I needed to do. You know, uh, I thank both my parents because they sent me to school and I went to school and I have degrees. So I'm like, ah, I can I can fall back. Yeah. You know. Well, it is. I mean, as we as we wrap up, I mean, it's been amazing hearing your story. Cool. We always like to be able to get us pictures. So if you had your top five favorites, say. Um, New Jack or even R and B tracks. What would okay. make your top five? My top, my top five would probably be. Uh, this is all across. This is this is. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, just uh-huh. yeah, just top five. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna throw some. <laughs> I'm gonna throw some at you that you probably wouldn't even guess. I like Mind on a Trip. That's five. Mind on a Trip, George, 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 boy, George. That's five. Wow. Oh, were you there like, when they were doing that? Yep, that's that's number five. No, um, were you were you in around when 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 they were making I, the track? I, yeah, I was around. Um, okay. That's number five. Um, number four would probably be "Spend the Night" guy. Great track. Yeah. Number three would be "Kissing Game." Um, high five. Uh, number two would be. It's a toss up between. Um, 
Goodbye, Love, and Peace of My Love uh, from Guy. Is that number two? Yep. Uh, and number one, my number one track for for New Jack for me is a uh, special kind of fool by the black. And the reason why that is uh, my nut because I was there. And um, it's a difference from when you're there. You know what I mean? Zan wrote that. And um, I was just, it was so crazy because it wasn't, it wasn't New Jack sounding because Daryl mm. wasn't using his full voice. He was using his falsetto, right? And so, but when we would go on the road, like the responses we would get from Special Kind of Fool were crazy. And so my number one would more than likely be Special Kind of Fool. It's an incredible track. It really yeah, is. It's incredible. Oh, I, I, I forgot. I, I, I like also, that's, that's, a, that's a good, I mean, I know you said five, but I, li I like is up there, up there in number four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by by, by by guy. Oh, okay. So, I mean, do, what, for you, first album or, or future? Okay, that's a great question. <laughs> I love the first album, right? But I respect the future album, and I like that as a close second. And I'm gonna tell you why is because Teddy dealt with somebody completely taking his style. And try and put trying to put another group against guy who had their own sound, but you know it was sort of like modeled after the first guy album, if you will. And then the second guy album, Teddy completely flipped it, flipped it, and was like, "I'm telling you, when we first heard, when we first heard the second guy album, the black and we were blown away because you know they got a song on there talking about the basic move you made is basically a waste why I won the race just to come in second place I was like I kill oh are you hurting me you know what I'm saying <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying I was just like I was like I literally felt like uh Dr. Dre and them would have probably felt when they heard No Vaseline by freaking Ice Cube it's because they <laughs> they killed it you know what I'm saying so the second guy album was crazy to me because he just changed. He was like, okay, bump you. I'm going to completely change my sound. And he changed his sound. So, you know, there were songs that I liked better. I didn't like the slow songs on the second album. Oh, yeah. The, um, TV yeah. Tonight. Yeah, and, I, I, I wasn't yeah. a fan of those. But everything else, Teddy's Teddy, man. Did you, I mean, did, you, did you know anything about, I spoke to Mucho years ago, Mm -hmm. And he said they, they were making a second basic black album at the time and they, they recorded were. stuff to, they to were. like to discs and they got stolen. He, he told me they, they, they got were. Stolen. They had this song called uh they had this song called um they had three songs that, that that I heard. One of them was called It's All Right. The other one was called uh Give Love a Chance, and the third one was called No More Mr. Nice Guy. Um they went so 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 no more mr nice guy was a mid-tempo and it was basically like dissing like we ain't nice no more no more mr nice guy uh get love give love a chance was sort of like a kissing game kind of beat and um it's all right was a slow was a slow song and those are the three songs i heard i don't they didn't have, they never recorded anything else as basic black um as far then then 911 came about okay yeah okay yeah yeah I mean, I, just as we before we wrap up with uh, with Idris, um, Sheldon, any any final questions? Then ask TV. I'm just blown away by the interview. I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of <laughs> oh yeah, that's stories, a lot of stories yeah, floating around there, and with each person, they kind of like close the gap on that on that whole GR situation. Because when you talk about you are going out to Duluth and Berkeley Estates mm -hmm. out there. You know, it just brings back that whole situation. So, yeah, hey, I'm just blown away. Yeah, man, there's so many stories, bro. But you know, uh, you know, certain people could tell them, and certain because when you're in the business, you kind of like don't want to. You know, I'm not in the business no more. So it's like I'm like, okay, this is what happened, and you know, for the most part. But at the end of the day, you know, th there's stories like this everywhere. I mean, I knew about the new edition story. I knew about the, you know. Stephanie Mills slapping jeans story. I mean, all of these did, there's a bunch of stories, you know, but, but I was there for a lot of them. And, you know, but it's great 
You know, I mean, one of the one of the greatest things I've seen recently is New Edition and Guy on the road together. Because you know, when all that stuff happened back in the days, New Edition it was on uh, it was on Al Heyman on the Al Heyman tour when that thing happened between New Edition and Guy. Neither one of them could tour with Al Heyman anymore, and so the wow. only the only way New Edition or any person could tour with Al Heyman again is when New Edition changed to BBD. And then they started touring with Al Heyman again because of that whole guy, you know, getting the guy from the security from guy getting shot, you know? So it was great to see them on tour together, man. You know, because all of these things, these guys got history, you know? So some, some mm -hmm. good and some bad, but at the end of the day, it's great to see all of them on tour, all of them healthy and all of them doing their thing, man. It was amazing. Yeah. Stevie, any I'm just like say I'm blown away, like Sheldon says. I mean, mm. I knew you'd have some stories. I yeah, didn't man. realize how connected you were, you know, yeah. before the Arb album and after it. And listen, yeah, those, you, those are my guys, man. Face, you know what I mean? Just blown away. Yeah. Um, and shout out to the black man. Check out their new album autograph. It's amazing. They got two new members, two, two, two new uh, members. They're not diesel, but you know, yeah, they're trying, they, they have a different, and Anthony, yeah, Sean yeah. and Anthony, they have Listen, a, is there any, any chance you can reach out to Redhead or Zan for us? I, I can try. I can try. I haven't spoken to them in a yeah. while, in a while, but, uh, you know, and shout out to Diesel's family. Uh, I think Diesel may have passed away from COVID because he, yeah. he passed away. He passed away 2020 in yeah. February. Um, and, uh, you know, COVID first cases was yes, in March. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, man, but it, that was a bad boy. But yeah, uh, Basic Black Autograph album is amazing. Uh, those are my guys. And yeah, man, great being on on here, man. Appreciate yeah, you. We, yeah, we went through every song um, um, on on the autograph. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, so it was definitely, it was definitely. And, and also, the, I mean, was it tough for you getting back into the flow when they got you onto, onto that track? No, nah, it's, um, 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 it's, 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 it's so if you notice that baby is the new Jack, y'all be knowing who that that's from the first album. I'm, I say that on the first, uh, the first album and they just took my voice as a sample and put it on the second, second. So if you listen okay. to the, if you listen but you, to the, you rapped it, but you didn't you rap on it? Yeah. If, but okay. if you listen, if you listen to the anthem on the first, on the, on the, on the, on the album that they had before autograph. Yeah, I, I say, uh, baby, it's a new Jack. Y'all be knowing who that. And what they did is they took that sample and made a song out of it, which is now on this autograph album is so sexy. It's called So Sexy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah but with the question to answer your question, um, no, man. I mean, I love, I love. You know, I don't do it, you know, on a regular. Uh, but it's always a passion of mine. You know, music and food are something that I love to do. So I'm always keeping my ears to the streets, and you know seeing what's out there so it wasn't hard for me to go in i was actually supposed to be on the other song back in the day but i i, I live in i live in uh, charlotte now so i couldn't get down there to do it so okay. i was supposed to be on two tracks but okay. i couldn't get to do the second one so to remind the viewers as well that the arb album has been re-released in japan on cd so on okay yeah i guess i guess yeah the, the, the arb the arb yeah. album is being re-released in japan it's a great so. new jack album despite you not feeling too happy about it <laughs> absolutely we, we this album, new jackers. <laughs> absolutely and it, and, and, if, it. And, and if they like it enough for, for for to get me coco and artie to japan maybe we'll maybe we'll do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean you know we we've heard so many i mean everyone who's come on board from um from basic black mucho um uh, timmy gatlin sprague Tammy Lucas, um, uh, um, even um, even guys from Uptown have, have all had their say about Gene Griffith. What could you say, um, just in passing, anything positive you could just... <laughs> I know he took everyone's money and, and all the publishing, but was there any anything positive we could just end on on, on, on Gene? Just so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, at, at, the, at, the, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, the man has a family, you know, um, yeah. And at the end of the day, uh, again, I'm Muslim, so um, we're not supposed to judge people. Allah is the greatest of planners. Allah can only judge. And so, I mean, the, the, the great thing I would say that he did is, like I said, he, he sees talent. Um, 
and what he what he did with his talent, what he what he did with what he saw is what he did with what he saw. But he sees talent, and that's you know you can't deny that. Um, no one could deny that. And Teddy Riley, and Aaron Hall, and Timmy Gatlin, and Spec KB and Mucho, and myself, and Artie Hoyle, and the Man, Redhead, you know everybody down. He sees talent, um, and he 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 can, he knows how to um, he knows how to nurture talent. Uh, so that, that's, you know, that, and, and a lot of people, you know, say that about him. He, he knows how to nurture talent, you know, at the Listen, end of the we day. Didn't so. mention, we did mention Coco enough. Does she, do you think she's got any stories to tell? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Coco's into making movies now. I, I'll get you her number. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's my girl. Wow. Coco's cool people. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, we're definitely going to uh, bring you back on to oh, onto, thanks, our, onto our podcast. Going to be good just to be able to, you know, especially as we get back into in, in focus on the music because we didn't realize the wide ranging um, areas that you were going to cover. So yeah. there'll be so much more because we, we we wanted to dedicate this opportunity to celebrate New Jack and, and really dive into other areas cool. of, of it and stuff like that. But okay. Yeah, we definitely appreciate you joining in. Absolutely. And, and, you know. Shout out shout out to my people in the UK. I have friends, childhood friends in the UK. Salim Acha in Bolton, Bolton and in Bury and shout out to 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 my to my bros in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Y'all take care, yeah. man. Hey, thank super you so much, Idris. Super, thank you. No super problem, brother. Respect, super uh, respect uh, to your parents, man. Super God respect bless. to your parents. <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Yes, take sir. care, man. All, All right. right. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>